Okay, so before we get started today, I wanted to let you know in case you haven't seen these flyers or gotten these emails, there is a health career fair downstairs today. Today is the second. Yes, so starting pretty much right after class, running till 5 p.m. Uh, so there are a bunch of different organizations uh, with healthcare jobs who are down there to talk to you. Uh, so check it out if you're interested, if you're thinking about planning uh, careers, planning your futures, uh, this could potentially be helpful for you. Okay. In terms of content for today, I know that last time we met talking about the autonomics was kind of a whirlwind. Uh, it's a really important topic, so it is worth slowing down a bit and touching back on that before we move forward. We'll probably come back and keep reviewing this topic throughout our unit. And if we get to a little less stuff by our exam, that's not the end of the world because this is, is important. Um, so what I've done, I'm going to project these uh, on the board as well, but I have also added a set of recap questions here if you want to work ahead in your slides. Um, but we're going to spend the next 15 minutes or so answering these three questions I've put up here, practicing looking at our information for the autonomic nervous system, practicing describing the autonomics and teasing apart these different pieces. So I put through three questions, one describing what the autonomic nervous system is, the second talking about roots of sympathetics and parasympathetics to effector organs, and the third one is identifying a receptor type. So I'll leave the first one up for the first five minutes, then the second for the next five minutes, and then the third. Um, if you think you're working faster than that, uh, go ahead and pull those up on your phones or on your computer. Um, but we will go over these. We can work together. You can ask me questions. Uh, but I want to make sure that we're really solid on understanding what autonomics are and at least the sort of broad brush strokes of what we're, we've been talking about at the beginning of the minute. Okay. So you're going to start by writing a little paragraph about the autonomic nervous system. And then a flow chart for the second one. And then the third one, you're just going to use that table to identify the receptor type.
So let's start going over a couple of these to check how we're doing. Does anybody want to tell me something about the autonomic nervous system and what it is here? What are some sort of words that might have cropped up in your hands? You got a diagram in front of you. So what can we see here? Sure, yes. The autonomic division has two parts. It has the sympathetics and the parasympathetics. What else? What else do we know about an autonomic nervous system? How about what, where is it going? Where is the autonomic nervous system going? Is it going into the central nervous system or out of the central nervous system? going out, right? Okay, so let's put that up here. So the way we're gonna describe that is we're gonna say, for our purposes, it's part of the efferent division and it's in the peripheral nervous system, okay? Efferent meaning we're sending out commands. What are our effector organs? So if we were to lift something out in the body, what are what are what type of structure would we be going to for the autonomics? Yeah. So our effector organs, we got smooth muscle. We got our cardiac muscle and our glands. The thing we might add from our memories just about the autonomic nervous system is that this is relatively involuntary. When we think autonomic, we think automatic. So you'll notice that skeletal muscle, right, like your biceps, right, is not controlled by the autonomic nervous system. It's the responsibility of a different branch, the somatic. So the autonomic nervous system is going to be controlling things like heart rate, dilation of uh, vessels in your lungs, things like that, things you don't think about. The full answer might look something like this, right? So we're describing the pathway. Right, we're saying it's coming out of the central nervous system, it's in the peripheral nervous system, so out in your body, it has two parts, the sympathetics and the parasympathetics, going to smooth muscle, glands, cardiac muscle, and you mostly don't notice it. You may notice the effects, right? You might notice your heart rate go up, you might notice your chest tighten when you're stressed out, but you're not thinking about doing those things that kind of just happen to you under the control of this part of the nervous system. So that's what we're thinking about when we think autonomics. So now we're gonna go on to the next piece. So take just an organ, Obvious. our next unit is the heart. So we might as well start thinking about the heart as our example organ now, and it's appropriate. Um, so let's think about sympathetics versus parasympathetics. First, 
Does anyone know why I asked you for both sympathetics and parasympathetics? I was trying to emphasize a point here by asking you for both. Just so you know, I asked it this way because we are going to have this property of dual innervation, right? We're not going to have an organ under just sympathetic control or just parasympathetic control. They are both going most places. When we do get to the heart, we'll see different parts of the heart. One part of the heart is not going to have both. Um, but on the whole, we're toggling between more sympathetic, more parasympathetic, but we're going to have both types of nerves going to these different organ systems. They're just going to differ in their activity level at different times. So let's start with our sympathetics. Our sympathetics. All right, so we're going to start with the central nervous system. All right. And then where is our signal first going? What what would we call that neuron that we're first on? What type of neuron is that? Perfect. Yeah, so we have a preganglionic neuron. And we can see on this slide that it is a cholinergic neuron, right? So we might then say, that it releases acetylcholine. That's our finger. Okay. All right. And what receives that acetylcholine released by our preganglionic neuron? We got a receptor, right? So we have a receptor. Okay. So a receptor on our postganglionic neuron. We could even specify that it's a nicotinic cholinergic receptor. And then we go down the axon of that neuron, right? So you might not have listed all of these as separate steps, right? You might have a slightly different pathway. That's okay. I'm just emphasizing a couple things for us. Okay, so I'm, we're on the postganglionic neuron. What are we going to release here from this postganglionic neuron for our sympathetics? Uh, norepinephrine, right? So probably norepinephrine. So this postganglionic neuron, we might also call an adrenergic neuron because it's going to be releasing norepinephrine. Adrenergic. It's going to release norepinephrine. And that's going to be received by some adrenergic receptor. Since I asked you for a most likely route, there was one additional thing I was thinking about with that part of the question here. It's about that ganglion. Where do we think that ganglion is most likely to be along this route? And the specific structure. Like, where would this signaling be taking place? I'll tell you, this is probably going to be happening in the sympathetic chain. Most, our most common route for our sympathetic nerves, that we come out a spinal nerve, you might have had that somewhere in your pathway, right? We go into the sympathetic chain, right? We synapse there in those ganglia with our post ganglionic neurons. Okay, so 
we might say that the preganglionic neuron went into the sympathetic chain. Right? You may have many different steps in here, right? There are different things we have talked about, different things you could emphasize in this pathway, but something like this. Okay, so for our parasympathetics, all right, we're still going to start with the central nervous system. Okay. We're still going to have a free ganglionic neuron. Okay. Now, first question to think about here, right? So I just It should be sympathetic, not sympathetic, sorry. Um, are we gonna to go to the sympathetic chain with our parasympathetic nerve? No, we're not. So we're gonna skip that step, okay? But we are gonna release ourselves a neurotransmitter. What neurotransmitter will this be between our preganglionic neuron and our postganglionic or our parasympathetic? Still going to be acetylcholine, okay? It's still going to release acetylcholine, and we're still going to have a nicotinic cholinergic receptor. And then we are going to be on our postganglionic neuron again. And what type of neuron? We're thinking about neurotransmitters. How might we phrase it uh, to call this postganglionic neuron? What might we say? Is it going to be adrenergic like the sympathetic? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Yeah, thumbs down, right? So this is going to be a cholinergic neuron. which means it's going to release acetylcholine. Okay. And take a look. So we're going to have a receptor on our effector organ again. But what kind of receptor do we have this time now that we're thinking about effector organs being signaled to by our parasympathetic? What do we see here on the slide? You do thumbs up, thumbs down again. Is it still nicotinic? No, it's not still nicotinic. Now we have a muscarinic cholinergic receptor. So this is pulling together a lot of different pieces of things that we are trying to talk about last time, right? So we have our difference between preganglionic neurons and postganglionic neurons here. We're thinking about location of those ganglia and specifically remembering that sympathetic chain exists for sympathetic neurons, but not for parasympathetic neurons. We're thinking about those neurotransmitters that get released and whether they're getting released by a preganglionic neuron, by a postganglionic neuron, whether that's part of our sympathetic or parasympathetic. Right, because that makes a difference for what neurotransmitter. We're also thinking about those effector organs and what kind of receptors they have. We're trying to sort of understand this whole big barrage. Right, so we're piecing all these things together. So our final question is just an example of how we might ask ourselves to identify a specific receptor. Um, so, real quick, you see this table is titled adrenergic receptor. So what part of the nervous system are we thinking about here? Yeah, so these are adrenergic receptors. So specifically, this means that we should already be thinking, just so we're orienting ourselves, right? This is sympathetic nervous system, okay? 
and we're thinking about these receptors are going to be on our effective on our effector organs. I'm just giving you some facts here, um, in a particular order. Um, and we're thinking about the norepinephrine and the epinephrine released by our postganglionic neurons. So that's kind of where we are. We're doing this communication between a postganglionic sympathetic neuron and the receptor organ. So this receptor, we know this is a receptor receiving sympathetic innervation at high affinity for epinephrine. So it's going to absorb lots of epinephrine bind to it. Ultimately, it's going to create an inhibitory effect in blood vessels. And the way it's doing that is after we bind to this receptor. We create this second messenger cyclic A and C. Okay, so using the table, which of these adrenergic receptors are we talking about here? Yeah. Okay. So we are talking about a beta two receptor, right? Beta two receptors. So we can link up this information, right? So high affinity for epinephrine is a real giveaway here, right? So high affinity, if we compare down this affinity column, right, already tells us high affinity for epinephrine is already telling us beta 2, right? So this, once we get our receptor straight, is, is a relatively easy example. We can compare in our effector organ effects, right? So inhibitory is another kind of giveaway here for our beta-2 receptors, right? This is special about our beta-2 receptors, both of these traits. And the cyclic AMP piece, right, is important to remember when we're identifying receptors in general, because the cyclic AMP piece, activating cyclic AMP, is what tells us already that we need to be thinking about beta receptors instead of alpha receptors. So we do something like this. Okay. So questions about these questions or these processes that we were just going through. Things that are still unclear here. I recognize that you haven't memorized these things yet probably, right? But I want to make sure that at least makes sense where you find this information. All right, so that is our recap for our autonomics. We're going to finish up real quick with that and do a little preview of some endocrine stuff. So when we left off, we were talking about the autonomic neurofactor junction. We had looked at a picture of it. So now we're just looking at process, right? So for example, Right, we might now be able to label here, right? So looking at these receptors, we can tell what type of nerve we're looking at in each of these figures. So we have a muscarinic cholinergic receptor here. We have an adrenergic receptor here. Okay, so figure A, what type of nerve do we think that is? Sympathetic or parasympathetic? going to be our parasympathetic postganglionic neuron here. Okay, so muscarinic cholinergic receptors. It's only our, when we're thinking about our postganglionic neurons, right, it's the parasympathetics that release acetylcholine, the sympathetics that release mostly norepinephrine. Okay, so this is going to be our parasympathetic. And this is going to be our sympathetic. And in both cases, we're looking at a postganglionic neuron. So this is that second one in our little pathway of two neurons, right? Postganglionic neurons. Okay. So at 
this neuro effector junction, so between our nerve and our effector organ. All right, so this beige-ish orange stuff, maybe it's a heart cell, who knows, right? At this point, who knows, okay? So our action potential coming down that axon of the postganglionic neuron, it is going to arrive at the varicosity, which is a swelling along these branching points at the end of these postganglionic neurons. This is kind of analogous to our axon terminal that we saw in our synapses in our previous unit. Okay. So first our action potential coming down here, right? So that's number one. And just like in our synapses, this voltage change, right? This change in the membrane potential flips open our voltage gated calcium channel. Okay. So calcium just like it wanted to come into our axon terminal, now wants to come into our varicosity, right? Because that has to do uh, with the electrochemical driving force. Okay, so it's going to trigger the exocytosis of the neurotransmitter, right? So it's going to trigger these vesicles docking onto our membrane and releasing that neurotransmitter, right? That's the bit for three. And the fourth thing that's happening, now we have that neurotransmitter in this space, right? So this is not a, exactly a synaptic cleft, but it's analogous, right? It's the space between our varicosity and our effector organ cell, right? So we're binding to those receptors on the effector organ. So that'd be our part four, okay? And then we're gonna have some type of response here. All right, so the response would be happening somewhere in this cell. All right. Okay. And then six, we're going to degrade and diffuse away this neurotransmitter. All right. So in this example, acetylcholine here is getting broken down into acetate and choline. All right. So that's six. And we might have parts of that or a whole neurotransmitter depending taken back up into our varicosity. So we can see that that's what's happening with the choline part here, our acetylcholine. So kind of both of these things are happening. Okay. So this is like a modified kind of synapse here between our neuron and our effector organ. Same thing is happening here in our sympathetic neuron. So Later on, you can practice with that image for yourselves, finding these different steps in that postganglionic sympathetic neuron. Okay, we are mostly we've been we've been trying to talk about some of this throughout. Um, so this is kind of just a, a little bit of a repetition of what we've been talking about. So we have dual innervation of organs, which is why I asked you about sympathetic and parasympathetics to the heart. We have a balance between those sympathetics and those parasympathetics. We think of the parasympathetics as our rest and digest. We think about our sympathetics as, I always think, S for stress, right? But that's your fight or flight response, or in general, excitation, right? Agitation, okay? So we're gonna be thinking about this as a dimmer switch, right? Like with our sympathetics on one side and our parasympathetics on the other side. So as we flip our dimmer switch towards rest, we're gonna have an increase in parasympathetic activity. We're gonna have a decrease in sympathetic activity. In the opposite way on our dimmer switch going towards our sympathetics, we'll have an increase in sympathetic activity and a decrease in parasympathetic activity. We don't wanna think about them as fully on or off, but we're gonna have them in opposition to each other. So this is an example of how these things sort of regulate, right? Uh, so this is an example of what happens when you stand up, right? So it is true that actually when you stand up, I don't know if you've ever gotten like that sort of gray vision with the stars when you stand up too quickly. Happens to me uh, sometimes. It's usually like a sign of low blood pressure, right? The reason that's happening is like gravity literally affects your blood so when you stand up really quickly, 
what actually happens is that all that gravity is pulling your blood to your toes, right? Pulling blood to your feet, right? So physically, force of gravity causes your blood to pull, okay? Which causes a drop in your blood pressure, right? So your blood pressure plummets, okay? Now it should be happening relatively quickly. Okay? So after that drop in blood pressure, your body wants to maintain homeostasis, right? So we have receptors that sense blood pressure. Okay. So we have some receptors. They detect that blood pressure change, right? They can sense that your blood pressure has dropped. Right? These receptors are located largely, we'll talk about where they are, but like around your heart and kind of in your neck, these blood pressure receptors. Okay. So we have these blood pressure receptors. Receptors are when we're talking about receptors for like stimuli for sensing things, sensing changes. These are going to go through our afferent pathways, signaling back up to your brain, right? Signaling up to your central nervous system. So they're gonna take an afferent pathway, right? And the way they happen to signal um, what your brain is like physically sensing in terms of like all this like neurochemical stuff is that they're just changing the pace of their action potential. Um, so don't worry too much about that part, but if you're curious, it's that those action potentials start coming slower. That's what your brain notices. Okay, so we have a control center in the medulla that integrates this signal, and then it sends out to your body, sends out signals telling us to flip the switch towards our sympathetics, so to increase sympathetic activity and to decrease our parasympathetic activity, right? So essentially it's going to be telling you to raise your blood pressure by making your heart pump more, by changing the diameter of your blood vessel, change that movement of blood to bring your blood pressure back up, right? And that should happen like that. But if you notice that sort of graying over, is happening a little slow or you're noticing this drop in blood pressure really fast. All right, so that's kind of how this whole system works together, right? This is why we care about the autonomics when we talk about heart and then when we talk about blood pathways later on in this course, we're going to be thinking in detail about how do we regulate things like blood pressure, blood volume, right? So this is kind of the basis for that is understanding these different types of signals that can have these effects. This is just a summary slide, okay? Um, and that's in a lot of different places. So again, at rest, we have both branches active. When we refer to something as having like tonic activity, we'll talk about muscles too. It means there's like a baseline kind of tone, a baseline kind of tension. So at rest, we have mostly parasympathetics, but both branches are active. And this is just a picture of some of the centers in our brain related to autonomic thinking. So next time we'll talk endocrine. And these are our autonomics. If you want to preview stuff for next time, you're free to go and back up, right? Um, but I would recommend taking a look at this slide if you want to be prepared for next time. Actually, just like kind of this figure. Oops. This figure can be a little confusing for people. So if you've taken a look and tried to figure it out for yourself ahead of time, um, you'll be ready to like ask questions in class. We'll be talking about different parts of the post, the pituitary, the posterior part, and the anterior part. This slide too. Okay.